Hi parents, hello hero, it's Petra Dita, welcome. Today we're going to have a very, very important topic. We're talking about making history here. Uh, we're talking about having, uh, working on putting parental alienation into the DSM-5. And with us, we have the honored guest, Dr. William Burnett, who is a child uh, psychi psychiatrist and a forensic psychiatrist. Uh, he is from the Vanderbilt um, University and is the chair of and the founder of the Parental Alienation Study Group. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Burnett. Yes, nice to see y'all. Thank you. Uh, and parents, um, please help me uh, again. Let me know if you can hear us okay. If we are live okay. It seemed to me that we are live, but um, as always, I think it always <clears> takes <throat> a little bit for my uh, for my system to refresh. So right now, I don't see any comments. But let us know. Feel free to bring uh, questions and comments. Definitely. Um, okay. So, Doctor Burnett, um, why are we like? Why should parental alienation be in the DSM five? Well, there's lots of really basic reasons. The most obvious one is that it's a real mental condition that's very uh, serious and it affects children and it affects their parents in a very real way. So it's a real thing that 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 we can, many of us can see. Um, people who are involved with this can see it right in front of our eyes. And it's and secondly, it's very serious. Uh, thirdly, it affects hundreds of thousands of children in the United States, uh, and of course, in many, many, many countries. Uh, there, are, I mean, there are other reasons. Um, it's for one thing, there are treatments for it uh, that that, uh, that can be used, and and but to, to get the right treatment, you have to be able to to diagnose, and you have to be able, able to identify the condition in the first place. So there's lots of reasons. Oh, and I guess the a, a big one that is gradually increasing is the research. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, we didn't have this so much research on parental alienation, but there is now that's very important. And so that's that's a big reason why it should be accepted. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and actually we should probably touch on what exactly is a DSM-5, you know, what's a DSM actually. <laughs> and by the way, we, I do see in the chat room, I mean, my system's still not loading, but I'm looking at somewhere else. And I see Mara, hi, thank you so much, Christine, Lisa, uh, Claudia, <clears throat> wonderful. Thank you so much everyone for being here. Please help us share uh, this so that more people can can hear and, and see this. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable sharing it on your personal Facebook or other places, share it in like groups that you are in because you know there's other people in the community that, that can benefit from this. Um, okay, I'm sorry. So let's go back to the NIC Nadine, Jennifer, thank you, Jane. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, you were saying, uh, so what is the DSM? So this is a book that is published by the American Psychiatric Association. And it is a big, big book that lists hundreds of different psychiatric uh, diagnoses of mental problems. And the DSM actually stands for, it's a long name, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So it's been published for since the 1950s and it's in different editions. We're now up to the fifth edition. So it's called DSM-5. Um, so it's a very important book because it, it gives definitions. It lists all these different diagnoses of things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and hundreds of other uh, psychiatric conditions. And it helps psychiatrists and psychologists keep track of these different disorders and and to be able to uh, give definitions so it, it helps people diagnose these disorders correctly. Right, and and actually, even though right now, uh, parental alienation is not literally as a wording parental alienation in the DSM, but there are other codes in the DSM, right? Right now that can be used to diagnose parental alienation. Uh, would you talk about that, please? Well, it was an interesting thing that happened that when uh, DSM-5 was being developed, my colleagues and I proposed uh, that parental alienation should be included. And there was lots of discussion there were many people wrote in and said yes, and other people wrote in and said no. But what was fascinating that when it came out in 2013, uh, the actual words parental alienation were not included, but the concept, the idea was included. 
and I'll give you a couple of examples. There is a brand new diagnosis in DSM-5 called CAPRD, which stands for Child Affected by Parental Relationship Distress. And the definition of that disorder has to do with a child who, who's uh, damaged by conflict between the parents and uh, how that might hurt the child. And so the, the actual definition is a paraphrase of the definition of parental alienation. And then there was another one uh, in DSM-5 called uh, parent-child relational problem. And that's when there are difficulties between a child and a parent and including uh, unwarranted feelings uh, from one to the other. And that's also a paraphrase of the definition of parental alienation. And finally, there's another one called uh, uh, child psychological abuse. And the definition of that is a paraphrase of what uh, we call alienating behaviors by the preferred parent. So that was interesting. And we later found out that, that this was, I guess you could say a strategic move because the people who put together that chapter of the DSM were, were concerned about the amount of disagreement and the amount of conflict. So they really didn't wanna put the actual words in, uh, the words parental alienation, but they, they, they kind of reached a compromise among themselves and put in these paraphrases so that so we can say the concept is in. What this really boils down to is that if there's a therapist or a psychologist who has identified parental alienation in a child or in a family, the, the, the evaluator can use those terms as a diagnosis. In other words, child affected by parental relationship distress or one of the other ones. So that, that's really helpful that in doing an evaluation, you can actually use those terms to identify what, what we would call parental alienation. The problem with those terms though, is that um, I think it include more than just parental alienation. Yeah, those terms are all rather generic. I mentioned C-A-P-R-D, and that includes not just alienation, but it includes um, serious family conflict. Like suppose there's uh, intimate partner violence between the mom and the dad. So that's clearly uh, comes under CAPRD, wow. parental relationship yeah. distress, and children are affected by that. But so the problem with CAPRD, it includes several different scenarios, um, and that makes them too generic, and it makes them so they're not really uh, satisfactory in terms of parental alienation. I mean, yeah, and, and child psychological abuse. I mean, there's so many form of psychological abuse. So then sure. again, that's too broad. So I think the need to have something that's specific, that that have specific diagnosis that and treatment that is different than other form of psychological abuse, I think it's important. Uh, but you did mention about the reason they kind of hesitating to put that in is because of the conflict um, or, or the, you know, the the controversial out there around this term parental alienation. Why is this term so controversial? There are people who are concerned that it will be misused. For instance, suppose a parent, suppose a dad actually does abuse his children and the children don't want to go to his house anymore. And so that would be called contact refusal. And the, and the children have real reasons to not want to go to his house. Well, maybe the dad knows about this idea of parental alienation and he might go to court and say the children don't want to go to his house because of parental alienation, which would be a misuse of that concept. So th there are people who are concerned that that happens frequently. I don't think it happens. I'm, I'm sure it has happened some of the time, but I don't think it happens so frequently. But that's one thing that, um, that people are concerned about. Uh, incidentally, the people who criticize parental alienation, all of them, as far as I know, all of them agree that the basic phenomenon occurs. They all agree that one parent, parent A, can indoctrinate children to be afraid of parent B and refuse to go see parent B. They agree that that can happen but they don't want to call it parental alienation. They want to call it something else or, the, or they want to minimize it or they, or they want to say, oh, it's very, very rare. So 
that is interesting that, that they all seem to agree that it happens. Uh, at least most of them do. I actually ran into one of these people actually a couple of months ago at a conference and, and she was making a presentation. And, and at the end, I, I asked a question uh, as an audience member. I said, well, what do you think about the actual phenomenon? Does, is it possible that one parent can indoctrinate children to be afraid of the other parent? So she, she said, she gave me a, an answer that surprised me. She, she, she said, well, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Well, this is a lady who's an expert in, in uh, domestic violence and has worked in this field for years and has written articles about her criticism of parental alienation. So I would think she would have figured out by now whether the phenomenon actually happened. But my point is that sometimes it's hard to get a straight answer out of the critics of parental alienation. Well, we have the whole entire organization called the Hero Circle that consists entirely of the adult children of parental alienation, alienation like me. We lived through that. So to say that it doesn't happen is, um, is definitely, a, 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 yeah, I don't want even to go in and describe that. But anyway, um, so there was a time when there was parental alienation syndrome. And now it's people only use the term parental alienation. What's the difference and why are we not using syndrome anymore? I think the two terms mean almost exactly the same thing, but there's a history to this. And uh, the word syndrome was introduced in 1985 when Richard Gardner initially wrote an article in which he, he named it. He talked about this condition that he introduced the term parental alienation syndrome. And after he did that, there was a huge amount of argument. P critics felt that he was overreaching by using the word syndrome because uh, in medical and psychiatric terms, the, the word syndrome has a very specific meaning. And the, the critics felt that Gardner had not proven that it deserved to have the term syndrome. And there was all this arguing that went back and forth. And when my colleagues and I started writing about this a few years after that, it, we just thought it wasn't worth it. The, the word syndrome didn't really matter. So we just stopped using it. And uh, our book about uh, parental alienation, when we tried to get it in DSM-5, I mean, we simply called it parental alienation. We didn't use the word syndrome. And, and most people, that's what almost everybody has done. Um, we're not trying to avoid the word other than the fact that people like to argue about it. So it's not worth arguing over that, that word when we can convey the same meaning without using that word. Thank you. Um, I do see Ayana, hello, hi, thank you. Kathleen, Chris, hi, thank you. Sarah, Sarah is in North Carolina. Um, my ex alienated me from our son officially since November 2020. My son's 13 now and it helped. Um, any great resources in North Carolina? Uh, we're gonna go more in these kind of question a little bit. I'm gonna try to go back. Um, so if I miss anything, feel free to like remind me um, because I want I do want to cover at least the, the content of, of this topic first. Um, Judy, hi, thank you. Judy's from Cape May. Uh, Lisa, um, been fighting since 95. Um, it's just taking so long. Kelly said, repeat that please, uh, C-A-R-P-D. Okay, so it's child affected by parental relationship distress. So that's C-A-R-P-D. Uh, no, C-A-P-R-D. That's right. C-A-P-R-D. Um, okay, uh, and by the way, we do have a, a, a poster on our Facebook page, as well as on our website that lists the actual codes of these three uh, diagnoses. Um, and and we'll, we'll post it after this interview on our Facebook, just just in case you don't uh, don't have access to it. Okay, well, Tanya, I saw your questions there. I see a question from Lisa, uh, Chris, um, and then Adam said, "Child gatekeeper." Actually, parental alienation has been, um, yeah. I think that's a the interesting conversation. We'll we'll touch on that in a bit. Thank you, Adam, for that question. Uh, Anna, uh, 
uh, Nihan said it's not rare. No, it's not. It's very widespread, actually. Um, uh, Crystal, it is said it's misused. Uh, Lisa, team. Okay, there's a lot more question. We'll, we'll go try to go through that. Thank you so much, everyone, really, for your questions. Um, actually, so yeah, I think um, there's something here that, okay, yeah. So actually, you mentioned 1995. Uh, no, sorry, 1975. Uh, 1985. 1985, sorry. Um, but really, parental alienation existed a long time before that, because this is not a pheno pheno phenomenon that was invented. This is human nature. Right? We're talking about behaviors and conditions that are created by human nature and human sure. uh, disorders. So this has been existed for a long time, right? Yes, and different psychologists and psychiatrists have described it. They use different words. Uh, one of the earliest one, ones I ever found was in the 1940s, which was a book by a child psychoanalyst in New York City who did research on, a, on something that he described as overprotective mothers. And he worked with a, a whole bunch of social workers and they counseled these pet families. And it's really interesting because some of the case examples of overprotective mothers were mothers who were possessive and took, took control of the children and prevented the fathers from having a relationship with the children. And so the, the behaviors that are described and, and all three of them, the mothers, the children, and the fathers are exactly the behaviors that we now see in what we call parental alienation. So that goes back to the 1940s and other people, uh, uh, other uh, psychiatrists described as, uh, people who did family therapy, for instance, uh, describe how uh, triangulation can occur in families in which two, two people get connected and exclude a third person. So in alienation, uh, parent A and the child are connected, and they exclude parent B, and and uh, you know that other people described that before Gardner ever came up with his description. Right, right, and uh, I remember. And if you guys haven't seen it, we had um, we had interview um, uh, attorney Ashish Joshi, who even brought examples from two hundred years ago. Um, you know, from the king, um, I forgot his name, but, you know, we've seen this recorded history that describes this exact phenomenon with these behaviors and the results that we are seeing today. And it has been re referred by many, many different names. Uh, but really, it's very important to have a unifying name so that we can all agree and work together on the solution and the treatment and 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 yeah be able to communicate effectively among the professionals and among the public and the patients and everything um yeah so so we tried before and it didn't work what are you proposed differently now that it would have a better potential of being accepted um well, and I wouldn't say it didn't work before. I think we got 50%. We got recognized. And like I said, there, there are these diagnoses that created paraphrases of alienation, but we didn't get the actual words, which is what we want now. Uh, the actual phrase we're, we, we want to see is called a relational problem. In other words, parental alienation relational problem, or P-A-R-P, PARP. Um, and this is in a chapter where there are other relational problems. I mentioned one, uh, parent-child relational problem. Believe it or not, there's something called sibling relational problem in that chapter. Uh, that The one we mentioned, CAPRD, is, is a relational problem. So um, the, the, the difference is that we have a whole lot more support now in different ways. First of all, we have hundreds or thousands of citizens who think this is a good idea. And many of them, Petra knows through her, through her contacts, are people who, who are endorsing this proposal. So I think we have a much larger base of citizens, affected parents, uh, children, uh, therapists, attorneys, and so on. Uh, secondly, we have a whole lot more research. There's um, 
an enormous amount of what we call qualitative research, meaning uh, qualitative means it's simply descriptive, that people have observed this in their practice and they write an article about it. And we have those kind of articles from 50 countries all over the world. We have articles in which people describe, usually psychologists or psychiatrists, describe a family with parental alienation. And they, and, they, and they hook it up to Gardner and they hook it up to some of the work that we've done. So that's, that's important to be able to have all those countries represented. But in addition, we have quantitative research. Quantitative means that statistics are involved. Um, maybe um, a simple example might be <clears throat> a study in which a psychologist had uh, a number of families and she uh, quantitatively uh, identified how, how severe was the alienation in the children. And then she also quantitatively determined how severe was the per alienating behaviors in the favored parent. So she has these two sets of data and then she statistically showed a very simple thing that the more alienating behaviors that were present in the, in the parent, the more parental alienation was present in the children. And that's interesting. I mean, in, in other words, it's a, it, it conveys a cause and effect between alienating behaviors and the, and the behaviors of the children. So that's an example of a quantitative study. I did a quantitative study in which I had a particular test uh, called the, uh, PARQ, the Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire. And I used that with a large group of alienated children and non-alienated children. And, uh, and this is all measured with numbers quantitatively. And the test was able to distinguish that the alienated children had particular scores and the non-alienated children did not. So that all this is research that's come around in, in the last five or 10 years, which is all new as far as um, making this proposal regarding this, di this uh, diagnosis. So that's actually a very important conversation, which is, um, and for parents that are not familiar with it, that recently a publication by Dr. Jennifer Hammond from Colorado State University, that study that did a systematic uh, review of the literature in this field in parental alienation. And what she found um, and her colleague found is that the field is exploding. There's, there's a significant increase in both qualitative and quantitative uh, research study in this field that show that the field is maturing. And so, um, and we have posted some information about this paper on our Facebook page before. Uh, we probably will bring her in and talk more about the detail of it, but we're happy to give you guys a copy of that paper if anyone's interested. But yeah, it's a very important paper to look at because it's, it's like Dr. Burnett just talked about. The field is is maturing, is growing. So it definitely, um, it's, it's a very substantial um, reason to show the validity and even the, and more importantly, the need to get this recognized. Um, so you said relational problems. So it, it, why is it a relational problem as opposed to, for example, uh, um, a disorder? Well, the DSM people have very precise definitions for different things that happen, emotional phenomena. So a disorder is the term that they use for traditional diagnoses, like schizophrenia is a disorder, bipolar disorder, uh, attention deficit, or what's now called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Their, their definition is that those conditions are inside of the person who has it. They're inside the mind of the person with that condition. In contrast, a relational problem is is between two people. For, in, for instance, sibling, sibling relational problem is between conflict between two siblings uh, that's serious enough to, to uh, cause distress among the two children, the two siblings. Or uh, parent-child relational problem is between the child and the parent, uh, which is serious enough to cause distress in those two people. 
So that's what they mean by relational problem. So what they, they use the word condition. In other words, relational problems are what the DSM calls a mental condition as opposed to schizophrenia, which is what they call a mental disorder. And th they use these terms very precisely. There's a particular chapter of the DSM-5, uh, which has, is called other conditions. In other words, it has to do with mental conditions that uh, might be addressed in an evaluation. And so what we're talking about would be in that chapter. It's literally called other conditions uh, as opposed to disorders. So they, they, anyway, we have to keep in mind their terminology. And so in submitting this proposal, we decided to, to call it parental alienation relational problem and that it goes in that chapter where other conditions are located. So does it mean that once it is in there, it actually can be used to diagnose in both the alienated parent and the child? Yeah, I, that's the way I'm thinking about it. <clears throat> I think that's true of these other diagnoses also. Uh, like sibling relational problem could obviously be used for one sibling or the other, uh, depending on who you're seeing. And yes, so my idea is that PARP could be used uh, for the child, or it could be used for the rejected parent, because the, the, the disorder is between the child and the rejected parent. Or I think a family therapist could use it uh, in describing a family, because, uh, because it's happening between two members of the family. Right. Um, and so how do you diagnose this condition? So there's been articles written about this. As time has gone on, uh, all of us, uh, other writers and myself, we've tried to be more precise. And so we, uh, we published a paper a few months ago on the diagnosis of uh, parental alienation. And th there are five things that you need. The first one is the child doesn't want to go see one of the parents. The child re uh, opposes uh, visitation with one of the parents. Secondly, there used to be a good relationship with that parent. Thirdly, the resistance is not because of bad parenting. In other words, it's not, be, it's not justifiable because, the, because that's a bad or abusive parent. Fourth, uh, alienating behaviors on the part of the favorite parent. And fifth, are symptoms or behaviors uh, characteristic of alienation in the child. So those are five things uh, that generally would be required for the diagnosis of part. Right. So, and so incidentally, uh, yeah. we didn't invent a whole new thing here. All those five things have been around ever since that paper in 1985 by Richard Gardner. But we, Dr. Amy Baker and I pulled these together into one list. In other words, rather than have one, one idea here and another criterion here, we, we wanted to make it simple for uh, people conducting evaluations to have one list of the five things that you need to have to make this diagnosis. And that's worked very, really well, that uh, clinicians use it. Uh, it's been used in court and judges seem to, to like it. Judges quote it back. They'll, they'll write an opinion and they'll write these five factors in their opinion. And they'll say that the, the case in front of them in court fulfills these five factors. So it's been pretty successful uh, having these five factors. Right. So yeah, so um, for people who are not familiar with this, this is the five factor model. It's a forensic tool to diagnose parental alienation. So there are many publications out there. You know, Dr. Burnett has a very important paper on that. Dr. Amy Baker has a series of papers on this. So um, PASG published a book called Parental Alienation Science and Law that has this model, but as well as a lot of, like there's a whole wealth of information in that book. I also have a book on uh, this five factor model on Amazon. So there's really a lot of information on this. And even when, um, you have someone that uh, that is not familiar with parental alienation, and even when you don't use the term parental alienation, if you just follow these five five factors and you, you present the facts for this, when you have a child that rejects a relationship with a parent and there's no good reason, so the other pa parent's not abusive or neglectful in any way, and you have um, alienating behaviors, you have, um, uh, you know, 
the child behaving in this very unique ways, etc. When you present it, it's just natural for somebody that looking at this setup data or information or evidence, it's natural for them to come up with the conclusion that that parent was being rejected for the wrong reason, and it has something to do with the behavior of the other parent. It's natural whether you wanted to agree on the term parental alienation or not. So it's very important for parents um, to, to be familiarized themselves with this model. Um, so, so you mentioned earlier about the acceptance, there's a growing acceptance of the term parental alienation. Uh, and also, you know, we talk about in the scientific uh, communities, the increase in research and things like that. Um, you talk about the widespread, uh, you know, support from the community. Um, and then recently, there's also a joint statement that was released by the AFCC and the NCJFCJ. Yeah, would you comment on that? And by the way, for people that are not familiar, uh, the term AFCC, AFCC is uh, American Family Conciliation Court. So, association, association of Family and Conciliation Courts. Right. And, and, the, and, what, NCJ, and the other one is? National NCJ. Council of Family and Juvenile uh, Justice uh, judges. Yeah, NCAA something like that. Judges. National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Yes. So it's, it's an association of judges who deal with family issues. And AFCC is, is a association of clinicians and attorneys and judges who are interested in family law. So over the years, these two organizations have collaborated in different projects, usually on the same wavelength, occasionally different. But a couple of years ago, they, they thought that they should try to agree, or, try, or at least attempt to agree, on what happens when children don't want to see one of the parents. For instance, we call that contact refusal. Some people call that resist, refuse dynamic. And there's been different ideas about these things. Uh, and these two organizations got in touch with each other, and they sat down. To, and they, in fact, came up with a joint statement regarding uh, contact refusal and, and how do you identify it and what should you, and a little bit about what you should do about it. But the main point is that both organizations agree on the reality of parental alienation. This joint statement is only a page and a half long, uh, but it, it mentions alienation in three different places. It mentions parental alienation as something to be aware of, and that alienating behaviors that, that people who are do pe see, see the idea is that pe pe children can manifest contact refusal for a number of different reasons, and they simply list among those reasons are the alienating behaviors by the favorite parent, and there are other reasons. There's um, separation anxiety or enmeshment for other reasons or. Uh, Right. Other people, other people being involved in the case, and so on. So that was really important for AFCC and NCJ, FCJ, to make to agree on the reality of parental alienation. Yeah, it's so important because, like you said, they 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 recognize that it can cause the rejection of a child um, toward a parent. But on, on also, I thought it was so important is that they also put in there that it's important for family law practitioner to get ongoing training on mm. these issues. And definitely one of them was denigration and parental alienating behaviors. So I thought that was so important because these are, like you said, the, the family court judges and the lawyers and the clinicians in the field. So it's so important to get that kind of recognition. So we definitely have, um, and, and I have seen sometimes people uh, will comment about, um, you know, how, you know, we have made no uh, progress in so many years, etc. No, actually, there's, there's significant progress that have been made. And that's why we get this kind of recognition now. Um, so how do, you know, we I see a lot of comments in the chat room. So clearly, it's of interest of, you know, definitely of, of my audience. Uh, how do these people help? How can how can they help? Well, I really appreciate so many people have helped so far. You know, we really only announced this three or four weeks ago. It was in July that we announced this idea and we invited uh, people to send in endorsements. And we have more than 2000 endorsements now 
from uh, individuals and from um, organizations. So your your audience can help with this. Uh, actually, let, let, let me just explain that uh, th there's a way to do it. There's a particular place you send them, but we're, we're right in, we're right in the process of of uh, launching the new website, uh, Petra, and it should be up in a day or so. And the website has everything on it. It has the actual proposal, the, uh, which we update, the, the most recent version of the proposal. It has, some people wanna know, well, what happens at the DSM? And we actually have the steps that goes through in DSM. And we have the appendices, the, these articles that are really important. And we have the, uh, the, the method for um, how do you endorse it? And, uh, and then actually we're gonna have a list of these 2000 endorsers. I, I hope that we're gonna have that on this website. So um, Petra, what I'll do is I'll let you know, hopefully in a couple of days when the website is up and that once that's up, that'll be the best way for people to, to get all the information they need and to uh, send in an endorsement. Right. So, so we we really appreciate the endorsements, not not just of huge organizations, but of individuals, parents and therapists and attorneys. So uh, we hope that your listeners will help us out in that way. Yeah. But, uh, so give us a couple of days to get this website up, and then it, it'll be easy for people to get whatever information they need. Right. Right. So really, it's um, it's. Um, so in a few days, I'm going to, when the website is ready, I'm going to let you guys know, but really it, it's anybody out there can help support this. You as the individuals, um, or you as a professional in the field, as a practitioner in the field, or if you are a part of any organizations, professional organization, advocacy organizations, really we need support because this is going to impact everybody here, really anybody in my audience, it's going to impact it's going to help your case It's going to help people that are you know in the future in this field so please help really anybody can help so please uh help with that um and really um so do you have some time could we pick some question i know there's a lot of question in in the in the room um yeah, yeah so i'm gonna go through and i'm gonna try to kind of stick closer to the dsm topic instead of personal cases uh kathleen said can i please get a copy so i said yeah in a few days, the website's going to be up and you're going to be able to get a, a copy of the proposal. Um, and the pro proposal is still, you know, there's still some update coming, but, um, you know, uh, I do have the latest copy. I'm happy to send it to you or you can wait for a few days to get uh, the, you know, the newer version. And by the way, thank you so much for, for allowing me to be a part of the committee. I'm really grateful to be a part of, of this. This is so important. Um, Christine asked about the five factor model. Do all five have to be met? You are uh, dealing with alienation. I think that will leave many uh, who will still get away with it. But actually, actually, that's a good question. Yes, that's a good question, and it's a it's a detail that we write about. But there actually are exceptions. Let me run through a couple. So I said that factor two was uh, the, the child had a previous good relationship with the parent who's now rejected. Well, suppose this, suppose that as an infant, the mother, when the child was an infant, the mother takes possession of the child and totally takes care of the child and doesn't let the dad interact with the child at all. He hold the child or feed the child or anything, even though they're all in the same household. Well that dad is going to end up being alienated from this child even though and but he never had a previous relationship because the mother took control from the very very beginning so that's an example of an exception where factor two might not be present right right um actually someone in my audience um the other day suggested that i watch um uh, the um the mini series on netflix it's called i just killed my dad and uh, it was interesting in that it's actually uh, an alienation case actually it's a very serious alienation case but one of the person involved in the in the process of that case was a woman who um 
when she got interested into DNA and all that, she did the DNA test and realized that the person that she thought was her dad was never her dad, and her dad never knew that she existed. So, you know, it's that kind of situation where, um, yeah, you cannot have that. You cannot prove the fact of the, about prior relationship you, if you didn't have the opportunity to even have that relationship. So, yeah, there are certain things that, that make prevent you from being able not being able to have all of the five factor met, but it's it's not a complete it's not a complete requirement all the time. There are exceptions for sure. Yes. Um, okay. Um I I see a statement about um please stop sweating this debunk theory. It's harmful to children. Please, Nancy. I mean there's so much science. There's so much support there. There's people like me who are living proof of this. I'm the I'm the child in that situation. I exist. is is not is not a fiction. Uh, there's a whole organization. The hero circle is. We are all the children. We're not fighting against our exes. This is what happened to us as children. Um, we have that whole chat room here. Are the parents that that are suffering from it? So, um, okay. How does one confirm that the alienated parent isn't abusive? Because I believe some children who are alienated are convinced that the alienated parent is abusive when they would. Um, yeah, this is, this is always a complex issue, isn't it? Proving, uh, especially well, when you have false allegations that get thrown in. That's part of the evaluation and it has to be done very thoroughly. And of course the evaluator has to collect information uh, from, from different sources, from both the mom and from the dad and from the children, from outside sources like physicians or child protection or law enforcement. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and it's something you have to try to figure out whether the allegations are true or not true. But you know, there's nothing new about this. I mean, this has been going on for years that, that psychiatrists and psychologists have contributed to these determinations and judges make these decisions every day in court every day there are cases in which somebody makes an allegation and somebody else denies it and the the court has to figure out what they think is the, the ultimate truth and and psychiatrists and psychologists contribute to that we don't usually make the final decision but we do an evaluation where we contribute to that process because we collect we collect the information in a methodical way from these different sources and then organize the information. So um, that's how we try to do it. And sometimes it's simple, sometimes it's more complicated. I see in the chat room, Gilly said, all five factor explained so simply well done. Our child fulfills five factor model and preparing a case for a listed case against the CPS uh, outside of children's court, they are trying uh, gagging threats and stalking my social media and my public Facebook group. Lisa said, oh my gosh, it's like people finally see it. I don't feel so alone. It, uh, it has helped me so much just learning about it all. Thank you all for that. Yes, thank you. Uh, Crystal said, uh, I wholeheartedly agree. I think she's agreeing to Kathleen comment, which I can't really see. I can see it said something about why don't the court recognizing alienating um, the court, uh, actually, we have a lot of interviews from um, attorneys that have successfully um, proved parental alienation in court. So um, the courts do recognize parental alienation, and there's always case law in so many states. So to say that the courts don't recognize it is actually not entirely true. There's a cons inconsistency, though, and also there's um, cases by cases, how your information is presented, um, the, whether the level of training of the judges involves, the uh, guardian ad litem, the professionals that involve in the case, your lawyers, the other lawyer, et cetera. So really um, it's hard to, to say it. And it's not just about parental alienation in anything. When you go to court, there's so many factors there, but it's not because the courts don't recognize parental alienation. I mean, we just talk about the AFCC and the NCJFCJ. That's the organization that, that are the judges and the lawyers and the guardian ad litem and, and clinician involved and they recognize parental alienation. So, so definitely. Um, 
Okay, uh, Michael said, what individual contributions can folks help with to make this more of a grassroots movement? Advertising the site is easy enough, but any practical thoughts? You know, it's already spread as a grassroots activity. I mean, all these people who have signed in and people, people spread it among their friends and colleagues, people post it on different internet sites or, or uh, Facebook sites and so on. So I, we, I think that's what we have. I think we have a grassroots movement happening right in front of us. And we really appreciate uh, everybody helping with that. I think the website will help a little bit more since it has all the information in one place. Right now, some of our information is on the PASG website and some of it is other places, but we need to get it all in one place. And I think that will help get the word out. Right, and um, I saw Claudia said you can you can do it by supporting this effort. Uh, yeah, definitely. So you can you can help support by like I said, once we have the website up, you can support through provide your direct support through that. But you can also help by you know sharing the information about this, sharing the website when it's ready, sharing this video, letting other people know about this among your friends, your family, things like that. Um, I see someone, I think it's Kathleen, it scrolled past my screen now, but said something about you can also help by, you know, um, legislation, you know, pushing in the legislation to, to let uh, legislators, these are the, you know, decision makers, the people that create the laws to know about parental alienation, definitely. Um, uh, and Tim said, I represent the um, Nevada chapter of parental alienation uh, intervention on behalf of John and I am available, um, and he put his email address on the chat. So, okay, Vivian said, I am, a, I am that child too. Vivian, thank you. Vivian, uh, I would love to interview you. Um, so let me know if you're comfortable to share your story publicly. Um, Lisa says that we didn't have the signs like this in 1995, unfortunately. Kimberly said, exactly. Um, actually, there's a question that I thought is interesting. It's very big. It's very important question. But maybe if we can cover a little bit, Dr. Burnett, uh, the question was, uh, so what would be the treatment for this condition once we add it into the DSM? Okay, so that information does not actually go in the DSM. The DSM is simply for how do you identify or have that diagnose something. But I think that that will lead to much more elaborate uh, research on treatment. But I can give you a general idea now. It depends on mild, moderate, and severe, since the treatment is totally different depending on how bad the situation is. And let me run through this real quick. Mild means the child says, I don't want to go see the parent. I don't want to go see daddy. But the child goes, and once he goes, everything is fine. That they get along, they, they're happy together, even though the child originally said, I don't want to go. That's mild. Moderate is the child says, I don't want to go see daddy. The child goes and is difficult most of the time. The child is oppositional, complains, doesn't want to do anything, doesn't want to have a conversation. There may be moments when the child loosens up and they're 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 somewhat happy, but generally they go they go and generally they're uncooperative. Severe is the child says, I don't want to go see daddy, and doesn't go, and is so adamant the child doesn't go. Or if the child does go, the child is totally negative during that entire time. So uh, real, real quick, mild cases, you, you can usually fix this by telling people to shape up. Uh, a psychologist can tell the mom and the dad, somehow you're influencing Johnny, you need to stop doing it. And judges do the same thing, that they use the word admonish. The judge admonishes the parents to not interfere with the child's connection to the other parent. Moderate cases are somewhat complicated in that the child is going but doesn't want to go. You got to have counseling for everybody, or I prefer to use the word coaching. You have to have a coach for the mother to tell her what to do and what not to do. You have to have a coach for the dad to tell him what to do and what not to do. Usually you have to have a parenting coordinator to meet with the two parents together. Incidentally, in these moderate cases, this has to be ordered by the court or else the people won't cooperate. And the parenting coordinator collects information and sends it, delivers it back to the court as to whether or not they're making progress. 
and other people need to help. The attorneys need to help. The guardians at litem need to help, and so on. So that's moderate. Severe cases where there's a severe amount of alienating behaviors, and the children are severely rejecting the other parent. We consider that child abuse. We call that child psychological abuse. And the intervention is the same as any other kind of abuse. For it to work, you have to remove the children from that home, at least for a while. That if parent A is indoctrinating the children to be afraid of parent B, at least for a while, the children need to be removed from parent A. And then somebody needs to work with parent A and help him or her shape up. And at the same time, the, parent, the children usually go live with the other parent. They usually go live with the parent that they've been rejecting. And usually that works out okay. A lot of times they need to have some kind of intervention or counseling to help communicate and so on and to work through the details. So that, that's a very rough outline, but, but it, it obviously is important to, to figure out whether this is a mild, moderate, or severe case. Right, because when it comes to a severe case, like you said, it's a, it's a, an abuse, a child abuse situation. So you are talking about child protection issue now. And with child protection issue, you cannot leave the child with an abuser. There has to be some separation and behavioral change committed behavioral change. So the abuser need education therapy to change that behavior. And the child and the alienated parents have to have a, the opportunity to rebuild their relationship. And um, so there are there are books and, and papers out there that talk about this. So for example, um, um, you know, Dr. Hammond has a review paper on turning points, for example, which is a, an intervention program. Uh, Linda Gottlieb has a book about, you know, parental alienation syndrome uh, that talk about um, treatment. So, you know, there are things that has to be fixed because there's a power dynamic that has been reversed between the, the alienated child and the alienated parent. The child lost the respect and the authority of that parent. So there has to be a way of re-establish that authority. They have to try to reconnect and rebond and by you know, remembering the history, the child had to learn critical thinking so that they can start question the false narrative by the alienator. So things like that. So you know, the child needs that kind of information or that kind of treatment for the severe case cases. So anyway, um, like that's a very big topic, but but thank you so much for kind of highlighting it. Um, uh, Gil said, I shared your information on, on my Facebook group. Thank you so much. As he said, so helpful for parental alienation parents. Uh, Michael said, thank you for addressing uh, that grassroots question. I do agree. I just want to help further. Thank you again. Um, um, Oh, okay, so Alicia said, Dr. Burnett, do you feel that your push to add parental alienation to the DSM will be successful? And how long will it take? I think the timing question is also kind of interesting. Like what would the process look like? Well, we're hopeful. We're pretty hopeful, but you know, in, in situations like this, you never know uh, what's gonna happen until it happens. But we, we the, the proposal has lots and lots of evidence and, we think that it fulfills the criteria that's required for a new uh, term in the DSM, but it takes a long time. Uh, I think we're gonna submit the proposal in November. So we're still collecting endorsements and we're editing the proposal between now and then, but it's gonna take months after that. There's a whole series of steps in the, uh, in the website I talked about, we, we actually uh, summarize in, the steps that are involved, uh, which I wrote up the other day. And it, it goes from one group to another committee and then back and then back and forth. And then they might get outside consultants and then they then they send it to the board of trustees and then they send it to the assembly and all it's all sorts of steps involved. Oh, then they send it out for public comment for a month or a month and a half. And um, it, it, it'll, I think it'll take at least a year once we submit it to the DSM to get a uh, to get a decision one way or the other. 
Right, right. So it's a long process. It's um, um, and by the way, in the chat room, I saw Jenny said, "Greeting from Romania." Uh, um, and this actually really get back to the point that Dr. Burnett was talking about earlier, which is this is a widespread problem. We see, you know, he mentioned about, you know, this is um, there's work on this field in over fifty countries. I mean, we see our audience coming from many countries around the world. It's a very mm -hmm. widespread problem. It's not it's not a, an American concept, definitely. Um, uh, Jamie said the symptom in the child of splitting. Where is that found in the DSM? I think uh, Dr. Burnett was talking about a particular paper uh, with the questionnaire that he uh, created. Uh, do you want to comment on this? Well, splitting is a psychological mechanism that's known for many, many years. We didn't invent this, but splitting is when a person says, um, this person, say the mother, is totally, totally good, is totally perfect. And the dad is totally, totally bad. And that's not a normal way for people to think. Most people say, oh, mother has some good points and some weak points. In other words, there's a combination of good and weak points. And dad has some good points and weak points. That's normal. It's very unusual for a child or a teenager or anybody to say, to, to say somebody is totally, totally good and somebody else is totally, totally bad. So that's called splitting. And that occurs in some mental disorders. It's not just in parental alienation, but it, it, you know, it's, been, it's been described over the years in many different uh, clinical situations. But it is a feature of parental alienation that in children who are alienated, especially more severely alienated, that's what they say. They say one parent is totally perfect. I mean, one kid said, my mother is my angel. My dad is my devil. And this kid made this up himself. In other words, nobody told him those words. He figured this out on his own internal mental mechanism. He, he engaged in that uh, activity, which we would call splitting. Right. And that is so important because uh, sometimes people that are not familiar with this field, they might confuse a child that, uh, an estranged child, which is a child that rejects a parent or not having a relationship with a parent due to the right reasons. So, for example, like abuse or neglect versus a child that was alienated. Um, the similarity is very superficial. It, like you have to go further into that. And one of the things is actually splitting is something that it's happened in the alienated child, but doesn't really happen in the estranged child. Um, well, that's true. Most children who are abused still have what we would call mixed feelings about the parent. They still say, oh, I, 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 want, I want to see daddy. I wish he comes home, but I wish he wouldn't drink so much and hit us so much and so on. So that's an interesting counterintuitive idea is that alienated children who were never abused engage in this splitting while children who actually are abused tend to not. Now I need to say something because I'm sure there are extreme cases. I'm sure there are kids who have been extremely abused and who say, I never want to go home. I never want to see the parent. I, that parent was evil. He, he, he was an evil person. And, and so I'm sure that in really extreme cases, the children do say, my mother was pretty good, but my dad was totally, totally evil. But that's not the typical kid who's abused. Um, in a typical evaluation, you're not dealing with cases like that. Those cases have already been taken care of by the judicial system and by child protection. In, in an evaluation, you're dealing with kids who are alienated versus kids who complain about mild getting spanked too much or something like that. Thank you so much. I, I'm so grateful for your time being here. Uh, and thank you so much, everyone in the audience. Really grateful you get, for you guys to be here. Um, please join our mailing list. It's on our website, victimtohero.com. Um, and please, like I said, please help us share this. I'm going to post this video on YouTube as well. If you don't know, we do have a YouTube channel where you can um, you can subscribe to that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Burnett. Dr. Burnett has been an incredible um, really legend in this field for the work that he has done. And if you guys are not familiar with it, there's Parental Alienation Study Group. So PASG.info is a website and you guys can join that organization. It's anybody can join. So 
you know, just submit a, a form and you can join that organization, which also has a, a, a wealth of information about parental alienation. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Burnett and everyone. I will see you guys again very, very soon. This weekend, I'm going to share with you guys um, a video that recently I was invited by um, a, a, a legislature in the East Coast um, to make recommendations regarding uh, what kind of legislation they should create in their upcoming session for regarding training for guardian ad litem and um, you know family therapists and things like that. So I did a presentation for them, uh, a recorded video because I um, I was actually traveling and not able to be there in person. But I will share that video with you guys this weekend. So look out for it. So thank you so much for everyone for your support and thank you so much, Dr. Burnett. Really appreciate your time. Okay, thank you.